21 Acres is a living laboratory which serves to educate our communities around climate change and how to participate in climate action through various ways. Um, these are by promoting and building resilient food systems that are rooted in agroecology and regenerative farming, um, sustainable land stewardship, and adopting sustainable living and building practices. We have a bunch of education on our website as well that I'd love to share with you after the tour. Um, 21 Acres is located in Woodenville, Washington on the ancestral lands of indigenous nations, including the Duwamish, Stillaguamish, and Coast Salish peoples. And we acknowledge these nations as the original stewards of this land and honor both the land itself and the Coast Salish people past and present. So thank you for taking a moment to honor this land with us and learn about how we're trying to steward this for future generations. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Emily and I'm going to disappear into the chat. So <laughs> you there. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that introduction, Rianne. My name is Emily again. Um, and before we start, we do take COVID very seriously here, but since it's just Becca and I, and we're gonna be outside six feet apart, I am gonna take my mask off so that you can hear and see me a little bit better. Um, and if I get close to someone, I will put it back on for safety. Um, so I'm Emily, I'm the education lead here at 21 Acres. And behind the camera today, we have Becca Jordan, who's our operations lead. She's gonna, she's gonna wave with her, with her gloves. Um, and I'm grateful to Becca for stepping in today. And she has an incredible amount of knowledge about the farm as well. She's out here frequently helping us out. So we're starting with the goats because um, they're just friendly, delightful beings. And while we're here, um, Rianne gave a great introduction of what 21 Acres is. And she mentioned the way that we farm includes land stewardship and agroecology. And I wanted to make sure that we were all kind of on the same page about what those things are. Um, so I will give an explanation, but while I'm doing that, I hope that everyone can try out the chat box feature. Like Rianne was saying, we want to get as much participation as possible. So can you practice by in the chat feature, writing out what's one thing you're excited about exploring today, either seeing or learning or discussing, just so we can switch up the tour a little bit, depending on what folks' interests are. We've got uh, Jennifer interested in beekeeping and Nancy cool. says goats. Uh, <laughs> Aaron is excited to see what we grow, definitely. It's cool to see the, the farm in uh, fall and winter too, to see how we adapt. And then uh, Robin, our beautiful, fantastic co-director, seeing nature. <laughs> so beekeeping, goats, nature, and seeing what we grow. Awesome. We can definitely include all those things, easy, easy. And if you have any specific questions as we're going, don't hesitate to add them in or if you wanna know more. So again, those two big concepts that Rianne was talking about, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page before we begin our tour. See these goats are just cuddling up to Becca right here. Um, so land stewardship is kind of how we practice caring for the land. And it's beyond just um, the land and the soil itself, but it's also about the community and the flora and fauna and ecological communities that exist. Um, so we are trying to leave this land in a better state than we found it. And we're constantly concerned about a more holistic community. Um, we frame our land stewardship through the practice of agroecology. And agroecology is um, a whole discipline and it's very complex, but a, I guess a simple explanation would be it's an ecological approach to agriculture. And we're sort of taking what our maybe standard high school understanding of ecology is and just going a little bit deeper. So ecology is not just those kind of biological systems, but it also includes um, cultural systems, political, economic, um, all, all different ways of understanding and knowing and incorporating that into how we look at the ecology of the land that we steward. I also like to think that, um, or like to talk about how agroecology is a practice, a movement and a science. <laughs> Lucky is agreeing. <laughs> so we'll kind of frame a lot of what we're doing here on the farm through an agroecological lens. And as we're talking about land stewardship, um, are there any basic questions about those two concepts before we continue? Not about those two so Great. far, but we do have a question about tech projects and I'll 
um, electric and solar projects. I'll actually be able to to jump in the chat and answer that question. Sorry. Awesome. And if we and if we see anything around, I'll definitely show you. In fact, maybe we'll we'll check out the compost pile where something like that is happening. So just like um. I think Rianne was saying it's, I'm really excited to have you here in October because it seems like the farm is closing down a little bit, but in fact, there's so much happening and um, it's kind of cool to like, almost like look behind the scenes. And that's what we're really going to focus on today. So we're going to look at putting the farm to bed, the crops that are still growing and restoration efforts, because as a restoration specialist would say, tis the season. And then um, I think we'll try to save some time at the end to go look at our compost pile too, because um, it's pretty exciting what's happening over there. Uh, Becca, do you want to add anything before we head out? Okay. Becca says that's it. So we're going to walk this way. Um, we have not super great internet on the farm because it is a farm. So you'll be able to hear me constantly, but um, I may go a little bit shaky as we're walking. I can close it since you're holding. Um, and just let Rianne know in the chat box if uh, I start to cut out and we will stop moving so quickly. But we are gonna walk on the quicker side out to the field first. And then I promise the video will get clear once we're out there. So it's October on the farm. And I don't know about you folks, but I'm feeling super cold today. We got that first kind of, uh, I always wanna say unseasonably cold, but that's not even true. Like it's seasonal, but I, uh, the cold weather always like surprises and offends me when it first comes. <laughs> so um, here we are on this sort of chilly morning in late October. And you can see on our left, we'll come back here in a minute, but there's some restoration projects going over here. And like a few of you saw at the beginning, we have some volunteers on our on our land today doing some restoration projects as well. So if you see some folks wandering around with wheelbarrows, that's what's happening. Brianne, how's the service? It is not bad. It's just Zoom and cell. It's always going to be a little grainy, but it looks really good. Actually better than our, our demo. <laughs> Yay. It's Becca's um, camera work. <laughs> She's laughing at me, but she, I, she says, I doubt that, but you're doing all she's 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 perfect we'll keep her um okay so oh actually this is unrelated to what we were going to talk about but this is like this area we just cleared out with our neighbor's bobcat big thank you to tom next door um we're gonna put a new greenhouse in here so stay tuned maybe come in next month and we'll probably be in the process of building it which will be incredible we built our first greenhouse. We built a new greenhouse in the native nursery last winter. And it was my first time kind of doing a full raising of a greenhouse. And my God, there is so much math involved in carpentry. I'm sure many of you know that, but it's always shocking to me. Okay, so we're out here on the, on the farm and you can see there's still a few things growing out here despite the cold. Maybe Becca can zoom in on these dahlias that are still pumping out. Ta-da! That is beautiful. Yeah, and we've still got some hardy greens out here. We've got um, arugula, some braising mix, these spicy things. Our beans are still in. We've got some cilantro we're growing for coriander. Coriander is the seed of cilantro. Beets, kale. So these are sort of um, cold, hardy crops. And you can see the beets are still really going for it. Um, trying to find a good one for you. Beets, you can tell when to harvest. They're sort of, their shoulders are coming up like that and um yeah so beets just love the cold weather and they're just going to get sweeter and more delicious so we still have a lot growing out here which is really exciting and I wanted to show you that before we start talking about how we're growing Ta -da. I would take a bite of this but I think I need to cook the beet first or at least wash it 
Um, so we kind of joke about on the farm that uh, we grow these beautiful vegetables by accident or it's sort of like a whoops. And the main thing we're really focused on in our land stewardship practices is the soil. Everything comes from the soil. Soil is the building block of life. And um, our soil management practices, just trying to keep this guy healthy. And um, every soil is different. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different soil types. Here on the farm, we have four main soil types. The one that we're, is out in this field, field block B, is um, Earlmont sandy loam soil. Um, and you can see it's kind of sandy. It's actually quite wet, wet now, so it's hard to... Um, see what the aggregates are really like, but it is quite sandy and it does stick together. It's very wet. This land, um, as Rian said, you know, historically stewarded by indigenous groups such as the Coast Salish um, was a wetland and our soil types uh, really harken back to that. So they're particularly wet and um, that affects how we manage our soil and grow food. So some of the ways that we um, effectively manage the soil is uh, we can't practice no-till agriculture. We practice low-till agriculture because of the type of soil that we're working with, um, meaning that we need to make sure that we're breaking it up and we're um, not letting the water pool and we're, we're supporting um, the hydrology of the farm. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, is anyone familiar with what type of soil they have where they live or where their community is? No takers. Not yet. That's okay. I can share a fun one. Actually on the other side of the farm and the farm behind us, there's a soil type called Tequila Muck, um, which maybe you can guess by the sound of the name, it's quite mucky and muddy, which also affects how you grow things. Um, so when we talk about soil health, we're talking about um, soil's ability to support life. And the soil health really is dependent on these three factors working together. It's this Venn diagram of physical properties, chemical properties, and uh, biological properties. So those physical properties, like I'm talking about the sand, the silt, and the clay, how much water and air is between all those aggregates. And those are physical properties that you can't really change. We can support our soil to grow better by adding organic matter, um, compost. We actually only want, in Western agriculture, we only want 5% organic matter in our soil. Interesting. Um, the chemical properties is those hundreds of nutrients and um, uh, pH involved in the soil. And we want our pH to be about, oh gosh, I'm gonna get this wrong, 6.5. Yes, 99% sure it's 6.5. And I'm now like second guessing myself, but we wanna, um, pH of 6.5. Um, and we can change that and we can, uh, by adding lime or other things like that. So we're trying to get that in the chemical, the physical to be appropriate. And then our biological health is kind of the exciting one. That's what makes, what makes soil alive. It's all of those critters um, and macroinvertebrates, worms, uh, sow bugs, nematodes, everything like that that's going to um, help decompose that organic matter and keep all the soil ecosystems alive and healthy and thriving. So when we're talking about our soil management plan, we're really focused on those three parts, working with our particular soil type here, Indiana, um, excuse me, um, Earlmont Silty Loam, to uh, grow our best beets and other plants. Any questions on that? Yes, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, you said the, the ideal pH is 6.5 and you can change it by adding lime or whatever. So what does it start at? Did you add lime to get it to 6.5? Is it actually we, we actually, yeah, we did lime our soil this year. So we take a soil test um, every year through different parts of our farm. And when you get that soil test back, and actually if you're a home gardener through um, King County Conservation District, KCD, you can do a yearly free soil test. Oh. from your backyard soil um, and go check out their website. Um, if, Rian, if you have that, you could drop it into the chat or we could send it later. Um, so we uh, test our soil every year because, you know, if I get my soil to the perfect pH and the perfect uh, balance of calcium, nitrogen, phosphorus, those are kind of the big, big daddies. Um, it's going to change the next year because plants, you know, take up nutrients and different types of plants are going to take up different amounts of nutrients and different amounts of um nutrients and soil material. So that's going to change the pH and uh, what comes out on your soil test. So it's important to do it every year and see what you're working with. So this year at the beginning of the season, we put lime in our beds. We measured it out. Actually, Becca was the measuring queen of that. 
<laughs> uh, we measured out. Do you remember how much it was back that we put in each bed? Uh, 12, 12 pounds, 15 pounds, 12 or 15 pounds of lime. And each of these, you can see about a hundred foot beds and then um, another couple bucket full of compost for that organic matter. So it's um, the amount that you're putting on and the way that you're applying your lime or your compost or whatever fertilizer it is, is gonna depend uh, very specifically on what your soil type is and, and what your um, soil test is telling you. I'm just curious there on your farm, do you know what the range, approximate range was before you started farming, just like the natural soil? That's a really good question. I'm not sure about, so this land has been farmed for about the last hundred years. Um, I can tell you that, yes, yeah, so I can tell you his, like way back since time in memoriam when it was a wetland, uh, wetland soils are highly acidic. Think of like bogs and wetlands. Um, so I know that it would have been highly acidic a hundred years ago. And then I'm not totally sure what the processes have been in the last hundred years or um, what it was like when 21 acres took the, the farm over. But I can do some research and find out for sure. Cool, thank you. Sure. And who, who is speaking? Oh, Jennifer Piper. Jennifer, thanks for the question. <laughs> I can't see, which is always kind of funny. Um, okay, yeah, so I just want to show you a beet. I had some beets with a roast chicken last night that I harvested and holy, wow, they are so sweet and delicious. <laughs> Um, I guess we'll just point out the kale too because it's been pumping out for months and months and months. Kale is such a cold hardy plant. Um, it's a great one to start in your backyard as well. This is actually Becca zooming in on my very, very favorite type of kale. It's called rainbow lacinato, which I had never grown before this season. Um, exciting. Okay, so we talked about so a little bit about soil science, a brief overview and about how we manage our um, soil to grow the most beautiful plants possible. I feel bad leaving this, but I'm gonna do the weird thing where I carry around a vegetable again. So maybe I'll, I'll put it here. Well, our last tour, I ended up carrying around this delicata squash for an hour. Um, so, Brian, what time is it? Can I get a quick time check? Uh, it is 11.26. Okay, awesome. Yes, we're going to go on to restoration. So um, when we talk about that holistic uh, land management and um, land stewardship through an agroecological lens, remember we're talking about kind of incorporating this larger sense of ecology and biology and cultural, political, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things we really emphasize on this farm is that ecological restoration is a farming practice. And um, that was kind of new to me when I started on this farm. I always thought of restoration as more of like an environmental practice that maybe supported farming, but was not directly integrated in and, and related to farming. And um, it's been really beautiful to expand that point of view for myself. So we do a lot of restoration projects and restoration, ecological restoration is essentially uh, building up and rest restoring. I'm trying to say this without using the word restoring, <laughs> is, is uh, caretaking and um, rebuilding uh, ecosystem that has been damaged or degraded over time. So when we talk about, again, you know, over a hundred years ago, all of this land, the Sammamish Valley where we are was wetland. And um, so we do a lot of work trying to restore various wetland habitats on our farm. So we know that there are certain areas that really want to be wetland. First of all, we're lucky that we have the history that tells us it was a wetland. That gives us a giant <laughs> step up. But we also know it wants to be wetland based on the flora and fauna that are present, as well as um, the hydrology of the soil, the way that the water moves throughout the farm. Um, so I wanted to highlight a couple of the restoration projects we're doing because fall is that season where we're really, really going gung-ho on the um, the farming. And the reason that is, excuse me, the restoration. The reason that is, is this is the time of year where you want to plant native species. They enjoy being planted in the fall and they thrive that way. Um, I'm sorry, I actually want to back up for one second because I realized I forgot to mention something when we were over here. So forgive me. But um, if you look to the south, can you see behind me? Um, there are a whole bunch of other farms. Viva Farm is right across the ditch there, which is connected to the Sammamish Valley. And I just wanted to highlight that we are at the very north end of one of King County's five APDs, Agricultural Production Zones, not protection, production, but uh, right? 
production, production district. Thank you. Not zone. There's no Z in there. Agricultural production zone. (laughs) Agriculture, agricultural production district. There we go. Third time. Um, And that's essentially uh, land that's conserved for farming. And Woodenville, I know some of you live here. And for those that don't, we're kind of in this really interesting nexus between the urban sprawl from Seattle in the King County area and then more rural as we head out further to the east. So um, we're, again, one of five of these agricultural protected districts, production districts that are protected. Um, And we're just at the far north end. So everything to the south of us is this protected farmland. Um, So I just wanted to share that and the importance of conserving farmland because land and soil is a non-renewable resource to the restoration. (laughs) I promise to get my acronyms right from here on out. Um, so restoration projects, the, the main um, goals here are to restore different pieces of the farm to that wetland habitat or to encourage other ecosystem services. Has anyone heard the term ecosystem services before? Oh, awesome. So ecosystem services is kind of like anything that we're doing that's going to support uh, the farm in this case. So things like uh, pollination or, you know, like uh, water retention or, or um, just like what, what the ecosystem can give back in that symbiotic relationship would be an ecosystem service. Um, so in providing or in, in, in performing restoration, we're uh, supporting the, f- the farm through ecosystem services. And most importantly, we are supporting climate action. Um, I also realized I'm all over the place. Right? We forgot to talk about climate action in the soil. We'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, so uh, we have some restoration, we have five, five acres of restoration projects that are ongoing on the farm. And um, I just wanted to show you this area that is just beginning to be restored because I think it highlights that living laboratory aspect that Rianne was talking at the beginning. So we don't have all the answers here. And um, we're really lucky that we have this space to experiment. So um, this whole field in front of you was completely inundated with reed canary grass, which um, maybe Becca, you can kind of zoom in here and show, show the good people. So this is reed canary grass, which um, I would say is my arch nemesis of invasive species. So uh, invasive species are different from um, non-native species, right? So they're native species of plants around here. Um, I'm sure that we could all name a few. Can anyone name a native species of plant? <laughs> There's lots of species of native plants. <laughs> Cedar trees are my favorite. Vine, vine maple, yeah, totally. And there's some good morels that you can find under vine maples. Oh. Um, Anyway, so, yes. Uh, So lots of native plant species, which are, um, you know, native to the soils and to the ecosystem here. There are non-native species that have been introduced that are also okay for the ecosystems and don't hugely disrupt it. So when we talk about invasive species, they're non-natives that have um, gained a foothold in these ecosystems and are really disrupting and damaging and degrading them. So this reed canary grass um, is native to somewhere and totally fine in that ecosystem, but here it just takes over. It grows and grows and grows. And um, what I can't really show you, but down beneath the root system is very compact and intense. And it's so compact, um, it actually starts retaining water. So the reed canary grass likes to grow in a wetland area and in the sun. And when it creates a blanket like this, um, the hydrology is disrupted. So we're actually seeing huge flooding in this field in the winter in this area, whereas um, we theorize that normally, uh, or before the, the inundation of the reed canary grass, the water would move effectively throughout this land down to the ditch and into the Sammamish. So, um, this reed canary grass is disrupting the hydrology and in holding that water so much, it's actually uh, messing with the, the soil composition and it's encroaching to the point um, on our fields where we're growing food. So it's, it's really become a nasty problem. So our restoration specialist, Jess, shout out to Jess, has been trying a whole bunch of really innovative techniques to try to mitigate this reed canary grass. So a couple of the tried and true methods are just mowing it down. And you can see a lot of this has been mowed down by some special guests that I'll talk about in a moment. And if you can mow it down before it goes to seed or develops those seed heads, you're um, 
slowly decreasing the weed seed bank, meaning uh, the seed, the weed seeds that live in the soil. And some of those, depending on the species of plant, can live for years or even decades. So we would have to be mowing this down vigorously every season or multiple times a season, every time before it um, creates seeds. And then maybe in like 10 years, it would be okay. But that is labor intensive and really would take a long time. So instead of just mowing it, we're trying out a few other things. So I want to point, can you see this giant rectangle of black plastic? Rian, can you see that on the camera? Yes. Great. So that is actually a giant silage tarp. And what we're doing, actually, maybe we can show them, Becca. Uh, what we're doing is we're trying to solarize the reed canary grass. We're killing it by kind of baking it in the sun. And since reed canary grass really likes the sun, it's not actually getting the sun to perform photosynthesis and continue to grow, but it is getting hot. And uh, so you can see if I pull this up a little bit, it's, it's dying effectively underneath. So we'll keep the silage tarp on um, probably until the spring and then we'll see what works. So those are kind of two mowing it down and then silage tarping it are two things that we've tried in the past. And this year, uh, Jess is trying two new things. The first of which, we had an incredible student farmer, Masra, who ran pigs right here. And he had four pigs um, and he rotationally grazed them. And this is an important moment to highlight how essential uh, animal inputs are to sustainable regenerative farming. You can, you can farm regeneratively without animals, but they make it so much easier. So these pigs were able to essentially kind of like till up the soil and eat out the reed canary rhizomes as we rotationally graze them around this field. And they were very, very effective. So instead of just going and mowing, you know, multiple times a week to uh, disrupt the, the seeds forming, the pigs did all that work. And we got some really tasty meat out of it. Um, so the last thing she tried, and this is what we did with a staff um, on uh, last Tuesday. So uh, Rianne or Becca, please jump in if, if you want to add to this. But we're doing something called live staking. Has anyone heard of live staking before? Nope. Um, not this, <laughs> not yet. Cool. So um, I'm going to show you a good example here. So this is um, a willow. It's just literally a stake off a willow. And we had three different species of willows here. I know we had Sitka willow, and I can't remember the other two species. Becca or Ria, do you remember the other two? Not sure. So we had three native species of willow that um, usually Jess goes and um, collects them herself from Utah Bothell or from our farm. But since we wanted to get a lot of genetic diversity, because again, if you're going to one willow plant or one willow tree and cutting off a whole bunch of uh, stakes from that, and then you planted them and there was some sort of disease, they would all die. So like the potato famine. So we want to make sure that we're really not monocropping, even if we're performing restoration. Or perhaps I should say, especially if we're performing restoration. So um, these willow stakes will hopefully take and start growing. Um, it's it's a, just a different form of asexual repropagation. Um, why we're live, stake, live staking? Why, Emily? Why are you sticking willow sticks in the ground? Um, willows grow really quickly very fast growing and they will grow and start to shade out this reed canary grass. And like I said earlier, the reed canary grass really likes that particularly sunny conditions to grow. So um, the theory is, and this has been tried a lot on uh, like riverbanks, I'm not personally aware of peer reviewed literature of it happening in open fields, but maybe there is. Um, and hopefully this will shade out the reed canary grass and be another asset in mitigating this invasive species. Um, so this has been just kind of a spotlight on one restoration project we're doing. Does anyone have any questions on uh, restoration? I have a question. Sure. It's Jennifer again. Yes. Did I see, do I see creeping buttercup in there among the oh. grass? And is that yes. a problem or is it just anything that kills the grass also kills the buttercup? Um, so I would say, uh, if you did like as a restoration specialist always says like invasive species roll call and if we wanted to talk about our like worst ones buttercup would definitely be up there i think our our three main terrible invasive species would be the reed canary grass 
bindweed and um, Himalayan blackberry. And I think, and then kind of the honorable mentions would be the buttercup, like you said, and then thistle. The reason that the buttercup and thistle are perhaps in a tier below the other two is they're just not quite as vigorous. Um, and they're not quite as disruptive. So if I have a field of buttercup here, like if this was a field of buttercup instead of reed canary, it would still be unfortunate and invasive, but that buttercup, it's uh, root structure is not quite as disruptive to the hydrology as is the reed canary grass. So it would be also an issue, but maybe not one that we're um, quite as like, deeply concerned about, if that makes sense. Totally, thank you. Sure. Um, I wanted to jump me, in. I think was a really fantastic experience. Um, we were a power team, even though we were both injured. We yeah. did it. <laughs> the whole field is is live staking. Oh yeah, Rianne, Rianne, Rianne and I were planting live staking together. That that was a great team. Um, I just uh, Becca's letting me know that her phone might die soon, so you might have to switch over to mine for a camera. Just FYI. Um, I just wanted to point out there's Jess in her uh, yellow sweater with a couple of volunteers and they're performing another type of restoration project, which is, um, you know, instead of being concerned about an open field with Himalayan blackberry and other it species kind of, of blackberry. Like we're losing you a little bit. Do you mind moving to a better health oh. service area? Yes, absolutely. I will talk as I walk. So there's um, some areas of restoration that we're working on where there are native species in sort of a forest glade area and we're just working on removing the blackberry from them to allow them to be their best selves. Um, so I think it's with uh, restoration, it's, it's fairly evident how it's connected to climate action. But um, you know, as we're restoring and rewilding we're supporting waterways, we're supporting native habitats, we're supporting native, um, you know, creating wildlife corridors and habitat. Um, there's just, we're also so both in our restoration practices and in our farming, we are really concerned with sequestering carbon in the soil. So I think most of us know that the main, uh, cause of climate change is uh, excess carbon in the atmosphere and agriculture is actually a huge perpetrator of uh, greenhouse gases and of getting carbon into the atmosphere. So as, as we uh, farm sustainably and regeneratively and with a focus on land stewardship that also really includes farming in a, a climate responsible and appropriate way. So one of the ways we're doing that is um, so doing our best to sequester carbon in the soil. Every time you, you till or you uh, harvest, you're taking carbon out of the soil and releasing it into the atmosphere. So you can mitigate that by um, doing low till or no till farming and um, composting, trying to uh, keep all of those nutrients and carbon actually in on the farm and in the soil. Um, with that, should we show them the compost? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to walk around this. Here's an, an area we had an incredible um, volunteer, Kevin, who just planned with the help of Jess and planted this native pollinator garden. So they've done the first planting in the fall and then this silage tarp here. There's that silage tarp again because, oh, Jennifer, this was a buttercup situation and thistle, really. Um, as you can see right here. <laughs> Do you want to just, that is what the buttercup look, looks like when it goes wild. Yep. Is that the grass <laughs> we're talking about or is that different grass? Um, there's uh, so reed canary grass. There's a little bit right here as you can see it's encroaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another way that we, before we go see the compost, another way that we really support climate action on the farm and keep the carbon in the soil is we are growing cover crop. Did we talk about this yet? Oh my God. Okay. So we're growing cover crop. Cover crop is anything you're growing in the farm. That's not for like a production yield. So I'm not growing it to harvest and sell or eat, but I'm growing it solely to support uh, the soil and other land practices. So right here we have buckwheat, um, which also has the added benefit of flowering and being really attractive to pollinators. Um, and cover crop, you can, I mean, there's hundreds of different cover crops. And this is like an ancient practice. This has been done by all different groups of folks all over the world for a very long time. And each different species of cover crop does specific things for the soil. So um, 
things like support uh, compacted soil. Maybe the roots go down. Like if you have a, a turnip cover crop, it's it's helping actually aerate the soil without tilling it. Maybe it's uh, adding so something like a legume, like a vetch cover crop, would add nitrogen into the soil. So support that healthy soil Venn diagram on the chemical side. Um, the turnips would be on the physical side, you know, with that air compaction. Um, and another main thing is you just never want to leave your soil bare. So when we talk about putting the farm to bed, we're making sure that there's no just open soil out. So this cover crop will grow a little bit and it'll probably die off and it might come back up in the spring, depending on the different types of cover crop. We mostly have winter rye grass out in the far fields and that will start really coming up in uh, March. And then just before it goes to anthesis or starts to develop those seeds, we'll terminate and um, turn it in. And we're incorporating all that carbon that had grown out of the soil back into the soil. Oop. Rian, are you there? Yes, it looks like so Becca's, Becca's. Becca's phone just died. That's okay. We are just gonna come on. I'm gonna turn my video on. Okay, awesome. Thank you for bearing with us with that slight technology difficulty. So we were talking about cover crop and talking about how when we turn it in at the appropriate time, we're, we're enabling ourselves to uh, keep that carbon in the soil and not um, let it go out into the atmosphere. So that's one way that we are sequestering carbon in the soil. Any questions on that? Yes, um, we have one. I was typing in the chat for, for Nancy, but I feel like you'll be able to explain it a little better. Um, Kind of when you were talking about carbon sequestration, uh, Nancy asked, what does low tilling exactly entail? And I feel like that's a good we were, connection between. When we were talking about carbon sequestration, Nancy asked, what does low till mean? Oh, Nancy's asking about low till. Yes. Thank you, Nancy. So um, I guess I should first define no till agriculture. Maybe I should say conventional agriculture. Um, really quick, here's an example of the rye vetch cover crop. So uh, conventional agriculture, the way that we think of, relies on tilling up the soil pretty intensely. And I'm making this motion because it's literally rototillers that are att attached to a tractor that are mixing up the soil and really disrupting those soil communities. Um, it's a good thing because it really quickly aerates the soil and um, activates that. So it's, it's, it gives you a quick and easy crop. However, it's um, disrupting those soil communities and it's very... Uh, it, sends a lot of that carbon that was in the soil up into the atmosphere. So there's pros and cons to it. And there's a reason that it's been um, widely practiced for um, many, many years, hundreds of years, hundreds of years in um, the US. But um, when we say no-till agriculture, that's a movement of regenerative ag, ag that's um, not disrupting the soil in the same way. So instead of turning over the soil, you're just going in with tools like uh, broad forks or things like that and sort of aerating but we're not actually tilling it or disrupting it in that same way. So low-till agriculture, which is what we practice, we really want to practice no-till agriculture. We really, um, that aligns with our belief system and our farm philosophy and our soil management plans. However, like I said at the beginning of the tour when we were out there, our particular type of soil doesn't support no-till agriculture. It needs a little bit of um, tillage just to, uh, <laughs> make sure that everything is working in harmony in that um, soil health and diagram. And great question when you brought that up because it really ties it all together. I'm going to try to reiterate in the chat. It was, I'm typing a lot, so it took me a while to get to her question. Sorry. <laughs> Rian can drop some more resources on that in the chat. So we're just going to keep walking this way because I do want to show you the compost before we run out of time. I think that's another um, really essential way that we're working towards keeping our carbon here on the farm. And here's another example of a, a <laughs> what looks like nothing but is in fact a field of cover crop. So It's so funny to to see these really, you know, these spaces and it's great to have you as a leader showing us this is an active zone that's actually, you know, saving a lot of carbon from going into the atmosphere. Uh, the ironies, I'm a fan of ironies, but it looks like nothing's happening, but 
everything is happening. <laughs> awesome. So uh, on our way to the, to the compost, I was trying to walk us through our um, older greenhouse um, to show you our harvest of winter squash. Um, I think this is just a particularly attractive <laughs> view. <laughs> um, the other side. We've got these gorgeous delicata squashes, um, which are just really tasty. Delicata actually doesn't need to get cured, but it is in here as the others. Some other types of winter squash need to be cured when you harvest them before you cut them. So we have red curry squash is particularly beautiful. And then we've got some kabocha and buttercup squashes over here, these green ones. And I'm hearing a truck out here, so you might need to... Oh, our wine folks are here. Oh. We have some of our neighbors, as you know, and maybe you don't know. I'm going to close this one talking to you um, In Woodenville, we have lots of wineries. And... Um, we have several neighbors at wineries who drop off their wine musk, which is, uh, I'll show you, but it's kind of like leftover uh, grape holes. And those are um, incredible assets to our compost pile. So thank you to our neighbors. I didn't know that. Learned yeah. something new. Um, we have uh, just to open, fine. by the way, Becca. Sorry, Rianne, can you say again? Oh, yes, we have just over seven minutes remaining. Just over seven minutes remaining. Oh really quick. We're just trying to do this really cool thing called static composting. Um, we have a lot of this really, really woody material from uh, the blackberries that come off. The blackberry stems are essentially just like miniature trunks, you know, like woody. So we're, um, we've struggled many years with how to compost them on site. There's just hasn't been a good strategy. It takes so long to compost and it's so much carbon material rather than nitrogen. Remember composting and decomposing is that perfect harmony, harmony between your um, nitrogen and your carbon materials. So um, you can see over here, this is the grape musk that they just dropped off. It smells so strongly. Yes. It wish does. I could share the smell. <laughs> <laughs> so here's all of our really, really woody and basic plant material. And um, the way that we're supporting it to decompose faster is, um, can you folks see this metal pipe? This metal pipe, um, these are kind of plugged, but when it goes underneath all the material, it has holes in it. And we have over here a little air blower that's actually powered by this solar panel. Excuse me, the solar panel right here that you can't really see. Um, so it's solar powered and it's uh, blowing air underneath this, uh, this compost pile, static air compost. And that is hopefully going to help heat the um and aerate the compost pile so that it will uh decompose faster and we're able to um not have you know these giant piles of blackberry just sitting around for like five years um so stay tuned this is very much experimental and you can stay tuned to see if it works <laughs> um so with that maybe we'll just end with a little view of the chickens here um this is chad our rooster who actually, with the help of um, some summer camp kids, we hatched from an egg. Pretty cool. So um, a giant thank you for bearing with me as with our tech difficulties and for uh, just kind of exploring this really fantastic transitional season on the farm. Any other questions, feel free to um, reach out via email or social media with anything you're curious about or things you want to share from your own um, homes and communities that might relate to what we're doing with climate action and growing. And um, just to reiterate, you know, uh, there are so many ways that we can mitigate climate change through our growing practice this is through the food system. I feel like we didn't get a lot, a chance to talk a lot about the food system directly. We were so excited about restoration, but um, just find ways to plug in in your community. And if you need some help understanding how to plug in, we are here as a resource. So with that, have an incredible rest of your weekend and um, please join us next month because each tour is going to be different as the farm changes over the winter. And I'll let Rianne have the last word. Thank you so much, Emily, and everybody for joining us again. And 
stay tuned for future uh, episodes with Emily and you can take a look at some of our, our, <laughs> previous, our previous uh, virtual education. I will follow up with everybody on who have registered on Eventbrite um, with an email that gives some resources to what we covered today. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care.